This is lesson 15, Jacob moves his family to Egypt. In the previous lesson 14, we followed the journey uh, of Joseph, his father Jacob, and the brothers who were traveling back and forth between the land of Canaan and Egypt as Joseph brought his family, his brothers, to a point where they confessed their sin and repented and understood that the situation that they found themselves in was probably a consequence of how they'd actually treated him. Little did they know that their brother, Joseph, was in fact Zephanath Panea, the governor who ruled over Egypt at the time who was in front of them. It came to a point where Joseph withheld Simeon and he had Benjamin uh, brought down to Egypt. So the father Jacob was in a terrible way because he found that he no longer had Joseph he just forfeited Benjamin and Simeon was being withheld in a prison uh, in Egypt. Little did he know that his own son Joseph, fulfilling God's plan to take care of his family, was actually the hand behind this situation that was ensuring that God's plan, God's covenant, uh, would come uh, into fruition. Uh, famine struck the land and uh, when Joseph was to... Uh, interpret the Pharaoh's visions, it enabled him to in fact come out of the prison and become the ruler over all of Egypt. Quite an extraordinary uh, journey. Uh, at this point in time when the famine struck and the vision was fulfilled, Egypt was the only country that had prepared and of course this was a consequence of Joseph. And Joseph uh, and his actions were a consequence of God fulfilling uh, his ability uh, to be able to interpret these dreams. So we can see that God's hand was all over this situation. So when the famine hit the land of Canaan and Jacob sent his sons down uh, in order to purchase grain, we see God's plan come into action to actually reunite this family and to bring them to a place where he would provide for them. So in this particular lesson, lesson 15, Jacob uh, learns that his son Joseph is in fact alive. In Genesis chapter 45 verse 26, we learn that when Judah and his brothers returned back to the land of Canaan, that they told their father Jacob, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. His father was astonished. In fact, he didn't believe them. Judah was hardly surprised. He understood that after the lies and deceit that he and his brothers had treated the father with in the past, that he would not trust what they had to say. So they explained at length what Joseph had told them. Then they showed him the ten donkeys carrying the best things from Egypt, the ten female donkeys carrying grain, bread and other provisions for his journey, and the carts that Joseph had sent to bring him back on. The significance of this was not lost on Jacob. His spirit was revived and he said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And this is recorded in Genesis chapter 45 verse 28. So Jacob's clan moved to Goshen in 1706 BC and this was during the reign of the pharaoh Amenhotep I. At this point in time, there were 66 family members in total. When Judah returned to Egypt, he took with him his three remaining sons. They were Shelah from his first marriage to Shua, the Canaanite woman. And there was Perez and Zerah, who were the offspring of his uh, faults uh, and poor choice relationship uh, when he slept with his daughter-in-law uh, Tamar and so he took those three sons but he also took his grandsons who were the sons of Perez and they were called Hezron and Hamul so we learn at this point in time 
that in fact when Jacob went back with his family, Judah's family, who we're following in the genealogy of Jesus, he, he in fact took his sons and his grandsons, so including Jacob, there was four generations that were returning back to Egypt, not just the one. So uh, when we look in the genealogy of Jesus and we go to verse 3, so we're going to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, but then we go specifically to verse 3, we see in that genealogical uh, verse there that this uh, generations, these sons and grandsons, are all recorded in the same line of the verse. So in the genealogy of Jesus, uh, I found after years of study that each line represents a significant period of time or generations uh, that represent a period of time. This is fact uh, is actually uh, one of them. Judah, his family and his servants packed up their belongings and gathered their livestock together and prepared for the journey down to Egypt, just as his brothers and his father did the same. Judah placed his family in the cart given to him by the Pharaoh, and when they were all ready, they set off southwards down the way to Shur until they reached Beersheba and stopped for the night. His father Jacob gathered everyone together and sacrifices were offered to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to, vis to Jacob in a vision that night and said to him in Genesis chapter 46 verses 3 to 4, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's hand will close your eyes. So Jacob was told that his people would grow into a great nation in Egypt, and that when he died that Joseph will be with him to close his eyes. So he knows before he goes that he's going to be with his son, his beloved son Joseph, and that he would be with him when he passed away. And then he goes on to say that his remains will be brought back from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. So leaving Beersheba, which is just a little bit further south from Mamre where they were living in the land of Canaan, they left in the morning and Judah once again, uh, as he travelled a couple of times now, passed through the desert of Pran and the Sinai Peninsula. Um, but as they approached the Nile Delta, Jacob sent him ahead with, uh, to meet with Joseph so he could get directions to where Goshen was. So Judah went ahead. So looking at the map there next to me, passing around Lake Timsa, which is uh, just near uh, Succoth and Pithom there, a little bit on the outside there on the edge of the Sinai Peninsula, uh, they went through Succoth and Pithom, and he followed the highway westwards until he reached the Nile River and turned south to follow its path until he came to the city of On from where his brother ruled. Informing his brother of his father's imminent arrival, along with all their people, he returned to them and led them to where Joseph had agreed to meet them in the region of Goshen. So on the map there you can see I've defined that area uh, of Goshen. So the people were to settle in the area of Ramses, as the Bible tells us, the district of Ramses and that's in this uh, region called Goshen. So just to fill you in on that, in Egypt they used to have these regions and they were called gnomes, so they would be you know, perhaps what we would define as a, uh, a suburb or a state in modern day times. And so ancient Egypt was divided up into these uh, various gnomes, so the land of Goshen was a particular gnome, so it was a it was a, a defined region. Uh, and this was the area where they had uh, agreed to meet. So hopefully uh, having a look at that map there, uh, you can see that region. You can see it's on the eastern side of the Nile Delta. So they're in amongst all of that fertile uh, land there. They've got the uh, the, the rich um, 
silt laden waters uh, coming through the Nile Delta feeding the land so it's going to give them great uh, prosperity and great grazing and obviously it's going to give them the provisions that they actually need so they're going to have water they're going to have uh, fields they're going to have water to uh, to water their fields they're going to have uh, grass etc for their livestock to uh, feed on so part of this plan uh, when God uh, basically engineered this situation by sending Joseph Firth is not only that the famine would create a reason for them to actually come down and then as a result of the situation having the brothers actually repent of their sins which once again united them uh, where they weren't united when they're in the land of Canaan because they hated uh, Joseph so obviously God's not going to build a nation on a on a uh, uh, a family of sons who were actually not getting along with each other. So here they are, they come down to this land, they've been reunited again because they've been struck by adversity. They've confessed their sin uh, as a result of what's actually happened and then they've been brought together. They arrive in the land, God gives them the best of the land. So here we are, we're talking about a time uh, where there's years of famine that they're going to have to endure and yet God places them in the best of the land so where everyone else is actually suffering uh, in the whole region we find in fact that uh, God's chosen people are now taken care of waiting in the agreed destination Judah could sense the yearning in his father to see his long lost son it was only a short period of time before he heard the sound and saw the dust rising from the road to the south. It was Joseph on his chariot. Regaled in Egyptian attire, he seemed to materialise from the distance in no time. Galloping hard, the horse was reined to a halt and Joseph, in all his finery, jumped down from the chariot to meet his father, Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 46, verses 29 to 30, it says, As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. There's something very significant about this verse, because when you actually read it, it actually uses the name Israel in replacement of Joseph of Jacob for the very first time in the Bible. So again, I'll read that. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph. So we have this situation where the use of the term Hebrew has finished uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible, as we know it, and it's now been replaced with the name Israel. So from now on, when we read the Bible, and we're talking about the descendants of Abraham, we're going to be talking about them as Israelites. The next significant thing that happened here, of course, is that one of the prophecies of Joseph's dream when he was a boy, when he was speaking to his brothers and his father, from Genesis chapter 37 verse 9 comes to pass. And this is the one where he says, this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And Jacob scolded him for this, his father. And yet here he was, he came to Egypt with his wife and his sons and obviously the rest of his extended family and they placed themselves under the authority of his son Joseph. So extraordinary. So we see a fulfilment of prophecy occurring at this point in time. Now Judah, uh, being the son, he was here throughout this whole situation so he would have been watching on. He was so grateful for his younger brother's forgiveness. He was relieved to see his father's joy and he was looking forward to the promise that Joseph had made to him. And you can see there in the uh, picture beside me, uh, we can see, the, see the elderly Jacob and Joseph embracing each other and all the brothers and the uh, family members there uh, in joy uh, at this uh, incredible occasion. Uh, so in Genesis chapter 45 verse 18 it says, I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. So this is Joseph's promise. Uh, so we have this uh, fulfillment 
uh, of the purpose uh, for Joseph first being sent down in the form of a slave to the land of Egypt. So Joseph then addresses his brother Judah with his other brothers, his father and all their household. And in Genesis chapter 46 verses 31 to 32, it says, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, so this tells us uh, that they're not in the same location. So Goshen, as the map showed, is clearly a separate location to the city of On from where the Pharaoh ruled and from where Joseph lived. So that means that his family were going to be settled in a place which was different to where Joseph lived because he was still in his role uh, ruling over the land of Egypt. So again, it goes on to say, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. Now Judah was selected with four of his brothers by Joseph to be presented before the Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh asked them, what is your occupation? So in Genesis chapter 47, verses 3 to 4, they reply, Your servants are shepherds, just as our fathers were. We have come to live here a while, because the famine is severe in Canaan, and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now, please let your servants settle in Goshen. With Joseph in attendance, the question and answer was interpreted so all could understand. In Genesis chapter 47 verses 5 to 6, it carries on to say that the Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, and if you know any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. So obviously Judah was pleased with this outcome. His brother Joseph had told him that Pharaoh would ask them what their occupation was, he also told them to say they were shepherds. This was because Joseph knew the Pharaoh would have them settled in Goshen, away from the capital. How do we know that? Because in Genesis 46 verse 34, it says, For all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. So obviously the Pharaoh would place them in a place that's far away from him and the people uh, of Egypt into this rural uh, area. And so it was. Judah settled his family in the district of Ramses as the Pharaoh had directed. Now after this meeting uh, finished, and you can see a picture there beneath me, uh, it shows the Pharaoh sitting on his throne, uh, Joseph bowing before him, and the uh, people holding court. So Joseph's there visiting with his brothers. There's a problem, however, with this particular image, and this is a common uh, problem with this particular image and the problem here is that it shows the Pharaoh as a mature man and this wasn't the case uh, history shows that he was still a juvenile he had his mother as a regent uh, and so this was one of the reasons where I've mentioned in previous scripture that Joseph was said to be the head of his household meaning the Pharaoh's household and that he was ruling over uh, Egypt because at that point in time he was actually ruling the land because the, the Pharaoh was a child. At this particular point in the scripture, uh, after this meeting that was held, Joseph brought his father separately to meet the Pharaoh. And in Genesis 47 verse 8, the Pharaoh asks a question and he says, How old are you? And it's a bit of a peculiar question. Why would the Pharaoh be asking how old was Jacob? Well, you see, the reason is that Jacob was 130 years old at this point in time. He was a great grandfather. So this was a curious question of wonder for Pharaoh Amenhotep I. The reason being is because he was still a child himself. Now, if we actually study uh, the different dynasties of Pharaohs, and the length of their lifespan, you find out that the average lifespan for a pharaoh ruling in Egypt was in fact only 15 years. The reality was is that many of them died very young 
and many of them had a variety of diseases. Uh, they were well known to uh, have children uh, with their own family members and a lot of the times the babies were stillborn and they would be born with various uh, defects. Uh, so we have this consequence that was happening. So when we watch the movies or we see beautiful pictures of pharaohs, you know, they're always regaled and looking very lovely. The fact is, is that when they examine the mummies in modern times, they find that the pharaoh's uh, spines are often beset with scoliosis. Uh, they have a variety of uh, diseases, arthritis, uh, for example, in joints. Uh, they find that they have brain diseases and various different uh, issues. So the reality is a very different picture to what's often painted uh, in the movies, for example, uh, and a lot of glossy books uh, are not the case. So here's this very young pharaoh. Uh, he's a child. Joseph is ruling his country for him, and he introduces uh, this uh, man who is uh, 130 years old. So the reality is, is that as an Egyptian child, he would probably have never met a man so old before. And so this is that wonderment that comes through uh, in his voice. Now the Bible tells us in Genesis 47 verse 27, it says, Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. So the situation for the people of Egypt and the people of Canaan, however, was very different. In the third year of the famine, the people of both regions spent all of their money for the purchase of grain. In the fourth year, all the livestock was given in exchange for food. And in the fifth, all the land was sold to the Pharaoh. After that, with nothing else left to give, the Egyptians sold themselves into bondage. Joseph gave them seed to grow crops, but established that a fifth of all produce grown was to be given to the Pharaoh. So we have this extraordinary situation where Joseph's obedience to God prospered his own people in Egypt, whilst the free people of Egypt had now become enslaved to their God, who was this Pharaoh. So it's quite an ironic situation. And this was all under the governance of Joseph. So the wealthy uh, nature of the Pharaoh became wealthier. The wealth of his own people grew wealthier, whereas the freedom and the wealth of the Egyptian people had now been reduced uh, to bondage. So uh, what an incredible uh, a story that happens here. So the famine itself ended in 1702 BC, so that was after seven years, just as the Lord had told Joseph. Joseph had steered the land of Egypt through the, this crisis and delivered a boy pharaoh untold wealth and ownership over the land within his kingdom. Joseph turned 43 years old in the same year, a year when Pharaoh Amenhotep I would step out from his mother's care to rule over Egypt independently. So he's grown out of being a teenager uh, and just finally uh, come of age to, to rule. Now Pharaoh Amenhotep I, he kept Zaphnath Panea, which is of course Joseph, but known as Zaphnath Panea, uh, governing the land of Egypt from the city of On, even though he had become of age. As a king, he concerned himself not with the administration of his kingdom, for that was the role of a governor. And what more trusted a person could he have in this role than a man of God who had delivered this nation from starvation and made him a wealthy ruler in the process. Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years. He was aged 147, and knowing his time was short, he called for Joseph, and he made him promise to take his body to be buried with his forefathers Abraham and Isaac in the land of Canaan. So sometime later, when Joseph was told that his father was ill, he brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to be blessed. Jacob claimed them both as his own sons and blessed them with two of the future 12 tribes of Israel. Now we might ask the questions that if two tribes were going to come from Joseph through his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, wouldn't that mean that the total number of tribes had now become 13? So this can be a bit of an area of confusion perhaps, but the answer 
is quite simple. And that's the fact that the tribe of Levi, they were going to be reserved for the future priesthood. So they would actually not receive land in the land of Canaan. So this is the situation uh, which we find. So Jacob, he's elderly. Uh, he knows he's about to pass away. He's blessed his son Joseph. He's blessed him through his two children uh, to give them a claim, if you will, into the inheritance of God's covenants. And that is that they will become two of the future tribes of Israel. So uh, once again, we see God's hand on this situation. After blessing the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, Jacob called for all of his sons to gather around, and under the spirit of prophecy, he blessed each of them, for amongst them were to come forward the twelve tribes of Israel. This was a call of love and unity. They were to stay together and not to mingle with the Egyptians, not to separate and divide as the sons of Abraham and Isaac had done. Through Jacob, the Holy Spirit was declaring that they were to be one people, unified together as the nation of Israel. In speaking farewell to his sons, Jacob foretells what the future holds for each of their descendants. So Judah, whom we're following in the genealogy of Jesus, who's the next uh, descendant uh, listed after Jacob, uh, he was the fourth son, which means that he wasn't first to hear from his father what the future held for him. So he would have had to wait patiently. His elder brothers Reuben, Simeon and Levi would have received their blessings first. As I said, being the fourth child born, Judah was fourth in line to be blessed. His father said, Judah, your brothers will praise you. We can read about this in Genesis chapter 49 verses 8 to 10. It says, your father's sons will bow down to you. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. So Judah was told that from his offspring shall come the royal tribe. His descendants would possess all authority to rule until, from the same lineage, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come to rule forever. So Jacob, on his deathbed, spoke of the day that Christ would come. So this is one of the prophetic messages uh, that we find in the early part of the Old Testament in Genesis, which speaks of the future coming of the Messiah. Quite incredible. So Judah sat patiently and respectfully with his brothers until each of them, the brothers that came after him, had heard from their father. Judah listened intently while his father gave his final instructions. And he says in Genesis 49 verses 29 to 30, I am about to be gathered to my people. So this is an expression that you'll find throughout the Old Testament. And when someone says, uh, I'm about to be gathered to my people, or the Bible says that someone was gathered to their people, it actually means uh, that they've actually passed away, they've died. So he goes on to say, Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephraim the Hittite along with the field. So we find out here that he wants to be returned home to be buried with his father and his grandfather. So Judah watched his father as he gave his final instructions. And when he finished talking, the Bible says in verse 33, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. So what a content way to pass away. He was surrounded by his sons and his family. He had fulfilled his part of the covenant promise. Um, and he had expressed his wishes to be buried uh, with his uh, forefathers, his own father, and his grandfather. What a, what a great passing. So Jacob, the Bible tells us, was embalmed for 40 days and Judah mourned him for 70 days 
with his family and this was the tradition of the Egyptians because they were living in the Egyptian land. So Joseph then had to ask the Pharaoh for permission to return to the land of Canaan to bury his father as he had sworn he would do. And just remember that Joseph had actually been taken on board there uh, as a slave. So here he is respectfully, even though he's ruling the country, uh, he's asking the Pharaoh for permission, remembering also now that the Pharaoh had come of age uh, and uh, Joseph was operating like a governor now rather than the, the sole ruler over Egypt. So the Pharaoh agreed and Jacob was given a funeral procession fit for the father of a nation, the nation of Israel. And you can see there in the picture beside me, uh, his uh, coffin being carried uh, by the bullocks in the wagon behind. You can see all the Egyptian standards being held aloft and you can see the procession behind. The procession behind uh, carries uh, various camels and on those uh, is the Canaanite uh, people. So uh, there was a combining of the uh, family uh, with a contingent of Egyptian uh, people. So he was taken to the cave of Machpelah, accompanied by his family, as I've just said, and all the dignitaries of Egypt. Joseph and his brothers buried him with his forefathers Abraham and Isaac, their wives Sarah and Rebekah, and his own wife Leah. They then returned to Egypt, and this becomes the end of the period that's known as the Patriarch. So uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob have now all passed away. So this era draws to a close at this point in time in the Bible and thus a new era begins. So this new era I call from nationhood to kingship. So this is a period of time in the Bible where God forms his people into a nation until this period of, and we're going to take this period through until of the time of the period of kings in the Bible. Um, so as I said I've called this nationhood to kingship. Now, returning to Egypt, Joseph was now age 57. Um, he had to separate from his family once again because Judah, now 60 years of age, returned with his brothers and their families to their new land in Goshen to tend their flocks and herds. But now their father had passed away, the brothers became concerned for their welfare, for they had sinned and wronged Joseph and were under no illusion that their well-being depended on his grace. So the question we can now ask is, how do we know that Joseph had not joined his family, like I've just stated, in the vicinity of Ramses in the land of Goshen? So the reason for this is that there's several scriptures that tell us this. First of all, earlier on, we find out that Joseph lives in the city of On, which is where the Pharaoh ruled from. The family were given the land in Goshen. So that gives us that clear indicator. But let's have a look at some of the scriptures and the way that they're actually written. So when the brothers were discussing their predicament, because obviously their father had passed away now, and everything that Joseph had done was about uh, reuniting with his father. So they now thought that, oh my goodness, the father's passed away, so now we're in for it because we sold him into slavery. So when they were discussing their, pre their predicament, it says several things. So first of all, from Genesis chapter 50, verse 16, it says that they sent word to Joseph. And in verse 17, it says, and their message came to him, meaning Joseph. Uh, and then in verse 18, it says they came to him and then threw themselves down before him and declared, we are your slaves. The Bible tells us that Joseph showed them the grace of God and said in verse 19, don't be afraid, I am in the place of God. So this reassured the brothers. It tells us that they were traveling back and forth. They were sending messages back and forth. And this is because clearly they weren't living in the same place. So reassured by these circumstances and this communication and submitting themselves uh, to Joseph, the brothers felt reassured and they re returned to the region of Goshen and then they would have went about their daily lives, rearing their flocks, their herds and their children. And amongst them, Judah returned to his own sons. No doubt, after everything that happened, he was keen to see them. And this, of course, was Perez, who had fathered his first grandsons, Hezron and Hamul. 
So when Judah arrived in Egypt, he had his son Perez with him, as I've mentioned earlier. So in the next lesson, we're drawing to a close with this particular lesson. And in the next lesson, we're going to look at what the Bible reveals about his son Perez and the history, the period of time that he actually lived in. We'll actually round that out in order for me to provide you with a picture of what happened during his lifetime because the Bible doesn't give a personal story at this point in time. It falls away um, now that they're actually in the land of Egypt. Uh, we lose uh, contact, if you will, with the individual story of the descendants which are recorded in the genealogy of Jesus. Well, thank you so much for joining me for Lesson 15, Jacob Moves His Family to Egypt. This is one of the epic stories of the uh, Bible. Uh, we see God's hand on this situation. We see uh, how he provides for his people. And you also see how he makes sure that the covenant that he made with Abraham uh, is uh, kept alive and how he uh, provides for his people in order that they're actually able to fulfill that covenant. So I pray that you've uh, enjoyed this lesson and uh, that it's sort of opened your eyes a little bit more to you know, the richness, uh, the tapestry of the Bible and uh, placing that in history, naming the pharaohs uh, to give you an idea. And in fact, uh, showing you, uh, because we don't have the names in the Bible, that there is in fact more than one pharaoh, that we've uh, gone from this period of time from when Joseph arrived in Egypt, where one pharaoh has passed away, and we actually have the next pharaoh, who was actually a child when his father passed away. As I mentioned, many of the pharaohs, they didn't live for very long. Uh, so this uh, pharaoh had passed away, and his son, in fact, was still a child. So uh, that made uh, the child's mother, the regent, uh, but as a female, she was uh, unable uh, to rule the country. She wouldn't have been allowed. Uh, so the story of the Bible, we see not only Joseph being placed there to actually fulfill God's plan, but uh, to be empowered to the point where he's actually completely and utterly ruling uh, the land of Egypt. So quite an extraordinary story. Uh, now, if you've enjoyed uh, this story, uh, if you're already a, a subscriber uh, that's absolutely wonderful uh, if you're not a subscriber uh, i have the address there uh, beneath me uh, for my youtube channel uh, if you type in the jesus movement paul brunton uh, that will bring you to uh, my youtube uh, channel uh, if you type that into the youtube uh, search engine uh, bar uh, if you would like to uh, open that up uh, press the red subscribe button and that will uh, uh, allow you to watch the many videos uh, that I am producing and have produced and that I will be continuing to produce uh, into the future. If you'd like to receive notification uh, of future videos, uh, you can also press that little bell symbol next to the red subscribe button. Don't forget, if you want to uh, be subscribed on YouTube, uh, and receive notifications you actually have to have a gmail account so uh, if you don't just create a gmail account go back to the red subscribe button press it again go back to the bell symbol press it again and then you'll be all hooked up uh, for the future uh, also these videos they're available on my website which is there beneath me the jesusmovement.com.au uh, uh, so you can go to my website and you can also avail yourself of those uh, videos. So thanks very much for joining me. My name is Pastor Paul. God bless you, and I look forward to your company on another time. Mm -hmm.